Um, when I saw the title of this panel, uh, Monetary Rules in Light of the Crisis, I sort of did a double take because the notion of monetary rules by definition that they should be somewhat timeless. The merit of a rule should not rise or fall depending on whether or not we had a crisis. But of course, the fact of the matter is that if we never had had the crisis eight years ago, nobody would have questioned the implicit monetary rules that we had been following up until that point. It's only because of the uh, unsatisfactory economic growth we've had since then that we're now having a vigorous discussion about whether we should have different monetary rules. And I'm sure people in this room must have like just gasped when they heard none other than John Williams, who is about as central to the fraternity of central banking in this country as they get, roll out the idea of a higher inflation target or a nominal GDP target a few weeks ago. In fact, when I saw the agenda of this year's Jackson Hole uh, conf uh, conference um, out in uh, Wyoming for the Federal Reserve, I thought, did these guys like steal the agenda for your conference and just like try and like uh, one up you? Because the theme of new monetary frameworks, which is with a theme of the Jackson Hole conference, is really central to what uh, we're going to talk about uh, on this panel. And I'm very pleased that we have three uh, terrific economists who are just perfectly suited to address this uh, um, uh, question, most of whom you probably know either through their academic or their popular writings, but I'll very briefly introduce them, starting uh, directly to my right. Peter Ireland teaches at Boston College. Uh, he has written a lot about uh, monetary policy, interest rates, inflation. Uh, he's uh, written recently, recently about nominal GDP targeting. Uh, Peter gets um, special points in my book because he's married to a Canadian. Uh, next to him is Miles Kimball. For a long time, you probably knew him as associated with the University of Michigan, but he is now, just before the trade deadline, he was nabbed by the University of Colorado. Uh, you might also know him by his, from his blog, Confessions of a Supply Side Liberal. And on the far side, uh, David Beckworth, who uh, many of you know because he's now here associated with the Mercatus Institute at George Mason University. He, um, he was previously at Western Kentucky University. He also um, the, uh, runs a terrific blog that I read uh, very regularly called Macro and Other Market Musings. Uh, and he also, uh, I believe, the really big deal to me is uh, selling NGDP tar uh, Target t-shirts. I'm still a little bit annoyed that I haven't got mine yet, David. So uh, I'm just taking this. I'm take, just taking this opportunity to remind you once again okay. that I haven't got my T-shirt. Uh, we're <laughs> so we're going to start, I think, with the far side. Dave, we're going to move down. Each of them is going to give a presentation, and then we're going to have a, uh, a roundtable conversation about it. All right, so the title of my paper is The Fed's Dirty Little Secret. It's getting late. We need a catchy title to keep you awake, so this is what it is. Um, and as we get into it, it's not really such a dirty secret, but I've, I've kind of framed it this way to kind of motivate what we're going to talk about. And you're going to have to wait to find out what the dirty little secret is to a little bit later in the, the talk. Um, I want to begin and motivate this, this idea there's a dirty little secret by asking why wasn't QE more effective? There's a long literature, not long, but there's, there's a sizable empirical literature that's tried to establish what did QE um, accomplish. There's been some evidence that maybe it, it tinkered with uh, yields, some mixed evidence on the real and, and uh, inflation effects. Uh, but overall, QE has been uh, disappointing relative to what was expected, the hopes, the claims. The FOMC claimed there'd be a stronger recovery. They talked about um, QE shoring up aggregate demand growth, and it just didn't happen. Uh, moreover, it didn't even help nominal growth that much. Um, it's one thing maybe to say, look, there's other things going on driving the real economy, but you would expect the Fed to have some meaningful control over nominal measures. Inflation has been a 1.5 percent, the core PCE measure, since about 2009. Um, uh, nominal GDP, I have a picture here, uh, fell below its trend growth and never recovered. Uh, none other than Brad DeLong found this astonishing. He noted it, to him it seemed like it would be normal or the way we do macro policy to return nominal demand to its trend growth path, and it didn't happen. Um, some have argued, well, maybe this is just a consequence of a financial crisis, right? Um, Reinhardt and Rogoff, of course, are the, the, um, Rogoff, excuse me, are the most prominent advocates of that. But there's been some other research that has said, look, it's not just the case that financial crisis must always lead to weak recoveries. It's conditional on the policy response. A number of papers have come out and argued that. And so that raises the question, why didn't QE at least shore up nominal economic growth, like, like uh, nominal GDP or nominal income? And I'm making the argument that the reason it did not is because um, the Fed cannot credibly commit to a permanent injection of the monetary base. Um, it needed to do that in order to get us off the zero lower bound in a, in a quick, efficient manner. 
Um, and I'm, I motivate this and talk about this in the paper, both from the quantity theory of money perspective, kind of a, a look back at some of the old monetarist discussions of this, but also from a new Keynesian perspective. Some of the research that uh, dates back to well, Krugman's work from 98 and forward, they look at what does it take to get off the zero lower bound, and they say a credible commitment. And in the paper, I, I, I note that that may even mean you don't actually have to have mo a monetary base injection, just a credible commitment to it. Um, and so in the absence of that, we weren't going to have a great recovery. Um, the uh, monetary base injections, um, be because the Fed couldn't commit, they were going to be temporary. Um, and I'll explain in a minute why they had to be temporary. And by making the monetary base injections temporary, and I know this was talked about with John Taylor and David Laidler, and I'll document the Fed's you know, intent that they are temporary, but because they are temporary, they've consigned QE to uh, the, um, oops, let me go back, slide, to the irrelevant results of, oh, let's see, where is it? Yeah, to the irrelevant results of Krugman and Woodford and, and Egertson. So uh, Krugman, um, to his credit in 1998, kind of rediscovered this, this idea that uh, I would argue that the monetarists had, had known all along that when you're at the zero lower bound, something that you have to do is you have to have a, a permanent and sustained increase in the money supply. Now, he did this from a New Keynesian model, New Keynesian perspective. Um, and, and following him, there was Egerson and Woodford and their, their Brookings paper and a, a subsequent spate of other research that's come out that's confirmed this. And what they show is, you know, given that central banks operate with interest rates when you're pinned at the zero lower bound, you need a permanent increase, only a temporary, uh, well, a permanent increase leads to a temporary increase in the expected inflation, weight, inflation rate. And the idea is if you have this permanent increase in the monetary base, you're going to rise, uh, raise the future price level, and that future price level increase will raise expected inflation today. And it has to be enough to push the real rate down. And so you know, the Fed's dirty little secret, I'm going to kind of cut to the chase here, is that QE was never going to spark a robust recovery. Given that the injections were always going to be temporary, and to the extent that they had to postpone the uh, shrinking of the balance sheet, they sterilized them with interest on, interest on reserves, um, it, QE was never going to, to generate the recovery that they hoped and claimed that it would. Um, I document some of, the, some of the claims that were made by Fed officials of what QE would do. But by design, it was not going to spark a robust recovery. And this is not to say it had no effect. On the margin, you know, spreads may have been tinkered with some. But in terms of a quick, robust recovery, it just didn't happen. And I think that's because these irrelevant results of, of Egerton and Woodford and Krugman and others has been borne out. And so what, what I do in the paper, and I, for sake of time, I can't go through all of it, is I go through and show how um, this understanding was, was well understood back by the early monetarists, it was understood um, by the new Keynesians, and the Fed went ahead and did it anyways. It's as if they ignored this whole literature that said, look, if you, you're at this point, you've got to go to permanent injection. So I'm going to just give an example from each camp, one from the kind of old monetarists, one from the new Keynesian uh, perspective. And, and I want to be also clear that that picture is a little, little deceiving there. there. There was no grand conspiracy at the Fed. Um, that implies that they knew better. I, I think it was more they were constrained by their um, commitment to low inflation. And that's kind of a, the, the other part of this, this paper is why did they make it temporary? And this was their commitment to inflation. Um, and, and in fact, I, I document in the paper that they claim to have a flexible inflation target, but it seems to have become more of a rigid, just straight up inflation target. And that has constrained their uh, activities. They're still fighting the last war of the 1970s when it's a new battlefront that's facing them. But moving on, let me, let me bring up uh, Bruner and Meltzer in an 87 paper. And they, they make this key distinction between a transitory injection versus a permanent injection, just to demonstrate they understood this, this difference. And they say the adjustment of reserve positions to transitory change by buying and selling federal funds or by borrowing or repaying loans at the central bank has negligible effects on interest rates and asset prices relevant for household and business decisions. They continue, a perceived permanent change in the monetary base initiates very different responses and has different costs. The adjustment to a perceived permanent change is reinforced by changes in price expectations. Um, just to kind of show through a little flow chart, a little model what the differences would be, here we have the equation of exchange. Um, and we're going to invoke this idea. I mean, what, what the monetarists are really doing is they're invoking this, this long-run neutrality of a money idea that in the long run, a permanent increase only affects nominal variables. 
real effects may be affected short run, but not long term. So we have the injection, the M term here goes up, moving forward. Is it going to be permanent or temporary? Well, that's based on the expected uh, path going forward. If it's going to be uh, uh, permanent, then uh, people expect prices to rise in the future, money demand goes down, and velocity goes up, reinforces that, and so nominal spending picks up. On the other hand, if you think it's going to be temporary, um, so the you know, summation of all future money supply growth is going to sum to zero, which means at some point in the future, money's going to be pulled out, and then potentially we have some deflation, money demand goes up, and we have an offset. Velocity drops, offsets increase in money supply, so there's no effect. And that's the argument they were making. Um, so a question that, that, that comes up, is this still relevant, this, this idea that some of the early monitors said, is the quantity theory money um, relevant? And of course, this has a long history, going back to, to at least uh, to Hume. Um, and I, in the paper, I, I do a, just a little uh, vector autoregression experiment just to see, look, can we still invoke this idea in justifying kind of the idea that escaping the zero lower bound requires a permanent injection. So I, I took a VAR and I estimated it over the period 1960 to 2007, quarter four, and identified an exogenous shock to the monetary base um, using long run restrictions. And, and I also controlled for money demand shocks or demand for monetary base that would endogenously grow. And, and this is what comes out. So this is a 1% shock. And what is a typical response? This is by quarters. So you see the, there's the 1% a shock, it, it, it still evolves about to about 3%, 20 quarters out. A nominal spending tends to follow that. Here's the price level on the, the bottom one. And then, by the way, this is, these are permanent shocks I'm talking about in this first column here. And this leads to an increase in the price level, but you'll note the price level takes time to actually catch up. Um, it's not really significant until about two years out, which is consistent with this idea of the quantity theory of money. That you have a permanent injection, eventually works its way through the economy, prices go up. On the other side, I, I I provide, provide the results from a temporary monetary base shock. And you see it creates no effect other than the 1% increase in the base shock is reversed uh, going forward. Um, the rest of the, the results uh, show that the, the money supply also goes up. And again, this is a, an exogenous monetary base shock. You know, I wouldn't expect M3 to go up proportionally if it were some kind of endogenous response. Um, real GDP has a temporary effect and goes down, and, then, and there's, a, there's a liquidity effect in the federal funds rate. All right, now for, let's move to the New Keynesian perspective, and I'll give an example of that in a minute. Um, but from the New Keynesian perspective, you know, they view monetary policy, and, and, it's, and it's the way the world you know, operates, and, and many of it, what we do, much of what we do in modern macro is, you know, kind of a New Keynesian perspective. But monetary policy is viewed through the perspective of the current and expected path of interest rates, and be precise, relative to the natural rate level. So um, something that would fall out of, of Woodford's book, and I'm missing an expectation operator on the right-hand side, so I apologize, but the RA term, that's the, that's the actual real interest rate, and the RN uh, term is the natural real interest rate. Um, the expected, you know, the sum of the expected differences between those drive the current output gap today, and this falls out of the, the uh, Michael Woodford's a uh, New Keynesian textbook. And so what this says is, look, the current state of the economy, the business cycle driven by the output gap is based on where rates are expected to go relative to the natural rate level. So what happens if you hit the zero lower bound? What do you do? What if the natural rate goes negative and that real one has a hard time going down there because of the zero lower bound on nominal rates? So in terms of the Fisher equation, if, if the nominal rate's pinned at zero, what has to happen is expected inflation has to go up in order to push that real rate down until it reaches the natural rate level. Um, that's kind of a New Keynesian perspective. And so this issue came up in the late 90s. Um, Paul Krugman and his famous Brookings paper looked at this issue, and he came to this following conclusion um, that a permanent increase in the monetary base is necessary to get that burst of inflation up high enough to bring the real rate down, the market will clear and have a recovery. So he says um, a monetary expansion that the market expects to be sustained will always work. Whatever structural problems the economy might have, if a monetary expansion does not work, if there is a liquidity trap, it must be because the public does not expect it to be sustained. Um, I'm going to throw in one more. I'll throw in Michael Woodford. He, he echoed that, that same sentiment. And, and I have a large list of New Keynesian uh, quotes that show that the permanent point as well as the uh, 
the uh, monitors, and you can in the paper to see all of them. I'm, I'm throwing another one out. This is actually from an op-ed in the Financial Times, but Michael Woodford was really critical of QE, and I, this quote I thought was, was in, interesting. He said, the economic theory behind QE has always been flimsy. The problem is that for theory to apply, there must be a permanent increase in the monetary base. Um, and, and so he, he goes on, and in the last part he mentions that the Fed has not promised to allow inflation, allow inflation to rise above its normal target level. And to be clear, they're not arguing for a 1970s type inflation. They're arguing for a one-time burst um, that would return the price level to its trend path and get us there. And one of the examples they invoke where this was not done, uh, and an example of the irrelevance result was Japan. So here's the example of the original um, Japan uh, QE that was mentioned earlier. The monetary base rose almost 75 percent. It was pulled back out in 2006, and so you see hardly any effect on nominal GDP or on the price level. And, uh, you know, Woodford makes the point that the fact that it was so big makes it non-credible. There's no way that could be permanent. A 75% increase in the monetary base would lead to a proportional rise in the price level if it were to be permanent. That's just not credible. The Bank of Japan wouldn't let that happen. So by becoming so big, when QE is undertaken, as it has been, it leads to big balance sheets, as has been discussed already. And those balance sheets are so big, they simply cannot credibly commit to an expansion of the monetary base. It would lead to runaway inflation. However, they need a little bit of, of a permanent increase to get the escape from the zero lower bound. Now look at that top figure there. I want you to compare it to this, this chart here. It looks rather similar. Well, this chart here is the Federal Reserve's own projection of its balance sheet. This comes from the Federal Reserve's um, annual report on its balance sheet. And every year since 2010, it's produced something that looks like this. Um, the black line shows the actual um, assets of the Federal Reserve, and the gray line shows its projection. This is actually from the 2014 report. The 2015 came out recently. <clears throat> but as you can see, um, the projected path of the assets the Fed sees going forward for the balance sheet is going to put it right back on that trend growth. And you can think of that trend growth simply as being you know, the growth in a monetary base given you know, regular money demand growth over time. Um, <clears throat> so I want to respond to the comments made earlier. Both Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen have committed to this. Um, the FOMC in the June 2011 meeting and the sept September 2014 meeting, they both, they, they all argued for, they all, they all lay out exit plans that say there's going to be um, this uh, reduction of the balance sheet going forward. Uh, I've got three minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this next slide. And, and why has this happened? Um, the argument I make is that the Fed has been committed to inflation targeting, and it's become more rigid over the past eight years. This is its core inflation, and instead of being 2 percent, it's average one and a half. This is a forecast from its um, projections from the meetings. And this is two years out. So two years out, FOMC officials are projecting that at most it'll be 2 percent. And by two years out, the Fed has some influence over, over um, inflation. Here's a three-year forecast. Some meetings it's available. Um, let's put this in perspective. Janet Yellen gave a speech where she laid out what her, her estimate of the real short-term real natural rate was in 2009. And she put it down as minus 5 percent. So if you think about what that would imply in terms of that Fisher equation, it would imply expected inflation of 5 percent. And there's simply no way the Fed would have tolerated that much of an increase in expected inflation to get the real rate down to the natural rate level. Um, I also provide a, a kind of counterfactual. What if, what if the Fed had tried to return nominal income to its trend path? And here are the different paths. And you can see inflation would have been anywhere from 3 to 3.5 3 percent, which again is far above the actual path taken. Um, so this leads to the QE, what I call the QE paradox. Central banks turn to QE when there's large aggregate demand shocks that push it to the zero lower bound, and they turn to QE as kind of a workaround solution. It's the way to, to get around it. However, QE creates a large balance sheet, almost inevitably leads to these large balance sheets, which means that the monetary base increase cannot be credibly made permanent. It's just too big. Um, but we need that. We need some small amount of a permanent monetary base injection. QE guarantees that that won't happen. So QE actually defeats the very purpose it's created for. The balance sheet gets so big that it leads to the uh, expectation that it won't be made permanent and therefore defeats the purpose of getting aggregate demand back up. Um, so my, my proposal, I'm, I think I'm running out of time here. My proposal is to have a rules-based nominal GDP level target. Um, and I have a, a real radical part that might get me thrown out of this conference. Um, 
and, and as is mentioned before, a level target allows for some flexibility and short-run inflation, so you can't escape it. Um, you don't actually have to do the, the explicit permanent increase. There's kind of an implicit commitment to that, and I explain how in the paper. But I also call for this, this target to be backed by the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, and this is to add credibility. It also incentivize, incentivize Fed officials to act properly. So what would happen is if the Fed did not hit its target, the Treasury would step in. For example, if it was below target, the Treasury would put a bond at the Fed. In the, at the Fed. Fed would give it money, and it would distribute it in an automatic rules-based fashion, and it would do the opposite if it was going the other direction. Um, and I'm going to have to stop there. I'm out of time, but the idea is if, if you look at the consolidated balance sheet of the U.S. government, that's what's really in, um, involved in a permanent expansion of monetary base. And what I want to do is, is apply this rule to it in a way that allows that to happen in a predictable, manageable, rule-based approach. All right. Thanks. Ah, there we go. All right, so I, uh, I realize that uh, professionally I grew up with the idea of rules, and so, so that, that debate about rules or, or not having rules seems uh, something that mostly predates me, but I, it's very interesting to hear this discussion. And I think the, the kind of legislation that John Taylor talked about seems like a great idea, you know, that you, you, ha you choose a rule, if you depart from the rule, you explain it, and that helps you get to a better rule. It's not that you choose a rule for all time, but that, you know, to, to have to explain yourself when you depart from a rule that you've, uh, you've formulated is both good science and good policy. Um, so this is, what I want to argue is that there is a lot of room for improvement in, in the kind of rules that we have. So I'm going to call that next generation monetary policy. Uh, I want to argue that monetary policy is really far inside the production possibility frontier. There are a lot of very interesting things we can do to improve it. And, and one of the most dangerous things would be complacency. So I've, I've uh, heard some people from with, uh, with some experience within the Fed say that there's a certain complacency in some quarters of the Fed acting like, hey, we did pretty well coming out of this crisis. It was, I mean, things could have been worse. And, and the particular individuals who, who, did, uh, who were in the heat of the battle, I honor them for making things not be worse. And yet, the standards we should apply for monetary policy going forward should be much, much higher standards than the kind of thing we've seen in the past. You know, it's, it's one thing to forgive the mistakes of the past, but it's another thing to say that that's okay for the future. It isn't. Uh, now, next... The, the next thing I want to say is that the value of experimentation shouldn't be underrated. We shouldn't dismiss monetary policy ideas just because they're new. It, it's just not true theoretically. On the one hand, you say, okay, we know how things work if we do the same thing as we always have. But if you do, if you do a formal model, the, the virtues of experimenting with new things can really be enormous. Um, I, I think there's a danger of complacency not just by central bankers themselves, but by folks working academically on optimal monetary policy, they, they can get into a rut. And um, one of the dangers there is simply writing papers justifying what central banks are already doing. And I think that's a dangerous route to go. I mean, you should, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing, I mean, it's one thing to assume that the folks in uh, private markets have developed some wisdom there, and there's a certain amount of wisdom in the central banks, but we haven't been doing central banking well for that long. So our assumption that there's such enormous wisdom that we should be explaining the wisdom they already have rather than challenging what they're doing, that's, that seems, uh, I, I think we're better off at this point still challenging it. Okay, so what are, what are some of the things, uh, so, I, and I'm going to emphasize interest rate rules here. The, uh, you know, the Taylor rule is essentially description of the Volcker and Greenspan policy. If you free up the parameters, it provides a scaffolding for talking about interest rate rules generally. The virtue of interest rate rules is we understand them. We understand how interest rates work really well. And uh, it's interesting that uh, at Jackson Hole this year, Ricardo Rice was talking about a return to interest rate rules. So 
So I want to set out kind of what I think is some of the exciting research agenda for interest rate rules. Um, eliminating the zero lower bound or any effective lower bound. Uh, well, I won't read all of these things, so I'll just, I'll just do them on the individual slides. The, the first thing, which is really foundational, is to eliminate the zero lower bound or any effective lower bound on interest rates. This is the most basic thing we need to do in order to get back to the normal uh, interest rate rule policy that we're used to. And people talk about negative interest rates as if they're something newfangled and weird. They're not. It's regular interest rate policy exactly as we understand best in theory. And the, the key thing, though, is that you have to lower all the interest rates, including the paper currency interest rate. And one of the things, um, so, I have a, so, so I have a full schedule this fall going to East Asian and European central banks explaining how to do this. It's really remarkably easy to get uh, these pieces of paper to earn a negative rate of return. If you have the, um, if you have the electronic dollar or euro or yen be the unit of account, and then you have, um, you know, basically you take, you go off the paper standard, but you still have the paper currency in existence. You don't need to get rid of paper currency to, uh, to have its interest rate be negative. Uh, one, one way to think of this is the following. If you, um, you know, the zero lower bound comes because we're worried that people will earn a zero interest rate on paper currency um, minus some storage cost. But think of the round trip. You withdraw paper currency, store it, then uh, deposit it back in your reserve account. All you need to do to interrupt that zero rate of return is to, to charge, charge the banks a paper currency deposit fee when they put the paper currency back in their reserve account. So it's actually remarkably easy to take away the zero rate of return that the financial markets would get on paper currency. And, you know, there are details to this. You can do this in a way that, uh, that tends to, uh, I mean, you can, you can shield regular households from negative interest rates in their, uh, in their, in their checking and savings accounts and so on. But anyway, there's, there's now a, a growing literature on this. I have a paper with Ruchira Garwal on, oops, oh no, what did I do? On um, breaking through the zero lower bound. That's an IMF working paper. I have a lot, of, a lot of links in how and why to eliminate the zero lower bound, a reader's guide, which is on my blog. Ken Rogoff has a new book, The Curse of Cash. Marvin Goodfriend gave a, gave a talk about taking paper currency off par at Jackson Hole this year. Um, the one difference is I would do it with a very sedate crawling peg, and he he's, was contemplating a, a floating exchange rate between paper currency and electronic money. But um, I would say I've been uh, advocating getting rid of the zero lower bound since 2012, and the shift in attitudes in the last four years has been really remarkable from, from being a totally, you know, out there, unthinkable policy. It's now... Uh, very much something that's being discussed. So this is not, uh, you shouldn't assume, the, the, the zero lower bound is a policy choice, not a law of nature. I think it's a very bad policy choice. Okay, but uh, take away the zero lower bound and we, we still have the issue of what should our monetary policy rules be. This is an area that, uh, that I hope to get involved in and, on, in the research, but um, I'm only beginning in the research, so this is a research agenda rather than settled research results. But let me therefore ask some questions. So the first question I want to ask is, uh, what, if, what if we double the coefficients in the, in the traditional Taylor rule? So, uh, um, so one of the talks here was talking about doubling one of the coefficients. What if you, want, what if you double both of them? Um, I would argue that central bank mandates appropriately emphasize inflation and to a lesser degree, unemployment, I, I think interest rate stabilization is less important than that. Uh, if we moved rates twice as much, could we close output gaps and stabilize inflation twice as fast? I think this is a very important research issue. We, we shouldn't assume, you know, maybe uh, changing interest rates twice as much would really get the job done of stabilization faster and allow us to move on quicker to the supply side issues because we're more quickly back to the natural level of output. 
I think that's a, that's an, a very, very important question. Notice that this is much easier to do if you no longer have a zero lower bound, because you need to be able to cut rates by quite a bit as well as raise them by quite a bit, but this is two-sided. You want to raise rates by a lot to get uh, to, to cut off excessive booms quickly. Second question I'd like, like to ask is, shouldn't we have data dependence in both directions? Shouldn't it be that you know, as it is, you could look at the Fed funds rate target, and it th does a stair step up, and then has a plateau, and then a stair step down, and so on. But there's this tradition, which I think is a bad tradition, that you should go, that you have a big penalty on changing directions. Well, if, if incoming data says, hey, we, we ought to go in the other direction, then we ought to go in the other direction. And putting a big penalty on changing directions seems to me to be a bad idea. And, and uh, notice, you're not, you don't, if you have no zero lower bound, you don't need to get oomph for monetary policy beyond the expectations implicit in uh, already in having a more approximate um, uh, random walk. I want to say, you don't have to go whole hog here. I mean, in, the, in theory, it could be a good idea to have kind of a jagged diffusion process almost for the Fed funds rate. You don't have to get, go that far to get a benefit from this. I would just argue we should have a lower penalty on changing directions. And interestingly enough, if you look back in the kind of Volcker and Greenspan eras, they, they change directions more often than in the more recent era. Um, and there, there's kind of this myth that commitment leads, has to lead to interest rate smoothing. That, that's, a, that's a technical topic, but I think that's basically a myth. Um, the, uh, okay, next question is, what about the relative importance of output stabilization versus inflation stabilization? Fortunately, sometimes this doesn't matter. There are many shocks that hit the economy where closing the output gap and stabilizing inflation are exactly the same thing. This is a remarkable thing theoretically that's called the divine coincidence. But there are other kinds of shocks where there is a trade-off between output stabilization and inflation stabilization. I think the big ones have to do with some change in a relative price. This is kind of relevant to what's going on, what the Bank of England is having to decide there, where they're expecting a, uh, a, a long run, a persistent change in the exchange rate and wondering how to deal with that. Um, I want to argue that probably in uh, many of the formal models are overestimating the cost of the variability of inflation relative to the output gap. Um, the, and this is for interesting reasons. The, the, the cost of the variability of inflation in the formal models have to do with leapfrogging prices causing people to go to the wrong store. And the cost of that depends on how sensitive people are, are to going to the wrong store, you know, going to a store that's not the store best suited to them just because it has an old price that's especially low. And so the more price sensitive people are between stores, the more you have to worry about stabilizing inflation, even in the, even in the short run. Um, those numbers, though, for the price elasticity of demand come from, uh, actually, so I did, I've done some research with Shushant Basu and John Fernald, who are the source of some of these numbers. So they measured the degree of returns to scale at 1.1, and then that translates into a price elasticity of demand of 11. But, uh, but I think that 1.1 1 .1, um, returns to scale is probably an underestimate, because when, when we did the work together, you know, we'd, we would find returns to scale for non-durable, say, as being 0.6, which really isn't credible. You, you're going to have at least a constant returns to scale of 1. So there, there are biases, because in, in the booms, you have lower quality factories and, and uh, and, and maybe workers whose quality is lower than you think who are coming online. So um, the returns to scale is probably bigger. And there's a relationship between the returns to scale and, um, and the markup ratio, and therefore to the e price elasticity of demand, and, um, which, which then implies that probably people aren't quite as sensitive to prices in going to the wrong store. And you can make another argument that uh, if there are barriers to entry, and, um, and sunk costs that also the price elasticity of demand is lower, and that makes output stabilization more important relative to in inflation stabilization than, than some of the short, or some of the uh, models are assuming. So th this, this is a very technical issue, but very important. 
and uh, relevant to a lot of things. It's also relevant to the NGDP targeting debate because do you want to have a price level target or do you want to have a nominal GDP target could easily depend on this. Okay, another question is um, what about adjusting for risk premia? So um, Mike Woodford and, and, and uh, Curtia Woodford say that uh, if you have a, an increase in the risk premium, you ought to drop the safe rate by about 80% of the drop of the increase in the risk premium. I think that's a good idea. And uh, what, what this is doing is um, it's, getting, it's getting reasonably close to say we want to we wanna almost target the commercial paper rate rather than the Fed funds rate. And uh, you know, this, this also goes in the same direction as financial um, you know, as, as what you'd want for financial stability as well. So I think that's, that's an important thing to add to the rules. Uh, now, again, that's something you may need to have eliminated the zero lower bound to do if you have a large rise in the risk premium, but this would have helped a lot back in, uh, back in 2009 and 2008. Um, finally, let me talk about coordination with financial stability. I want to argue first that if financial stability concerns are affecting your monetary policy, you're not using your other tools to get financial stability enough. Um, other than, particularly that's true because other than possible aggregate demand effects, there are very little social costs to having a very high capital requirements. And on this, I'm very much uh, in the same camp as Anad Admati and Martin Helwig. In particular, we should have very high capital conservation buffers. There's no reason to allow uh, banks to, uh, to pay dividends or buy back their stock until they have much, much higher capital requirements than they have now. And uh, I want to, uh, let, let, me, let me end by, uh, well, let me show you this. If, if you have both low interest rates and high equity requirements, then you can get both higher aggregate demand and more financial stability. Those are two policies that work better together than separately. So to, to finally, I, I just want to say there's a lot of potential to interest rate policy. We, I think we ought to aim for something like, or hope for something like closing output gaps and stabilizing inflation within about a year, limited mainly by the lag in the effect of monetary policy. We don't need to have QE, which a lot of people have talked about the disadvantages of. Uh, we don't need fiscal stabilization beyond automatic stabilizers. We don't need helicopter drops. We can go back to the great moderation and hopefully better than that. We can get closer to staying at the natural level of output all the time and uh, return to focusing on the supply side because we've got the monetary problem more nearly solved. And we can't get there with complacency or timidity. We have to really boldly forge, fold, forge forward. Okay, um, so in this paper, Mike and I uh, not only advocate for a rules-based approach to monetary policy making, but in addition, we choose to cast our preferred monetary rules in terms of quantity variables, measures of the money supply that really haven't appeared in mainstream monetary analyses for years or maybe even decades. So question one is, how did we get to this point where it's possible to analyze and even make monetary policy without any reference whatsoever to any measure of the money supply? I don't blame John Taylor for this. Instead, I think it has to do with a, a broader uh, professional consensus that came together actually around the time that the Taylor rule was first presented in the early 1990s, but much broader uh, than just that. The consensus was that previously stable empirical relationships between measures of money and other key macro variables like output and inflation weakened or maybe even broke down altogether at some point after 1980. In light of that professional consensus, one of the themes that Mike and I want to bring out in this research is the idea that measurement matters. If you take care to work with appropriately constructed monetary aggregates or properly adjusted measures of the monetary base, you do see these empirical relations continue to appear, even in data after 1980, and they do seem strong enough to continue to serve reliably as the foundation 
evidence for a rules-based approach to monetary policy making. Here uh, is an illustration of just that. What this graph shows are year-over-year -year growth rates in our preferred broad monetary aggregate, the Divisia MZM aggregate. Divisia MZM includes all of the assets included in standard simple sum MZM, but the aggregate itself is constructed according to the economic aggregation principles developed by William Barnett in much of his work. Now, the data are noisy, to be sure, but what you see with the Divisia aggregate is that uh, pro-cyclical patterns in money growth do seem to appear, even in samples after 1980. Notice, for example, that distinct declines in Divisia money growth appear to uh, presage or foreshadow each of the last three cyclical downturns in the United States. Here, likewise, is our preferred measure of the adjusted monetary base. For the monetary base, the measurement issues are slightly different. Here, the problem, so to speak, is that the Federal Reserve has been paying interest on reserves. And when it started paying interest on reserves, it worked to shift the demand curve for reserves potentially very, very far to the right. A lot of the increase in reserve supply brought about by quantitative easing may have done nothing more than accommodate that shift in demand. And to the extent that it did, QE never should have been expected to have any effect or big effects on broad money growth growth, let alone output and inflation. So to correct for these demand effects in this paper, Mike and I follow some uh, recent work by Jack Tatum, and we simply subtract off from the Fed Reserve uh, Bank of St. Louis is measure of the adjusted monetary base excess reserves. Since it was excess reserves that were minimal before the financial crisis, they ballooned since then. But the excess reserves have been locked up, so to speak, by the Fed's simultaneous decision to pay interest on them. So again, as you can see from the graph, with this adjustment made, pro-cyclical patterns in money growth continue to appear even after 1980. Sharp declines in money growth appear to presage each of the last uh, three cyclical downturns. In this next set of tables, we aim to quantify the relationships seen visually in the graphs we were looking at just a moment ago in the following way. We take our two measures of money, and in this case, nominal GDP, and we pass all of these three variables through a time series filter intended to isolate their cyclical components. Then we look for the strongest positive correlation between the cyclical component of nominal GDP and those of quarterly lags of our measures of money, and we report that strongest correlation together with the lag at which it can be found in the table. So two takeaway points here. First, notice how moving from row two, a subsample before 1980, to row three, a subsample after, the lags needed to find the strongest correlation between money and nominal GDP, they lengthen considerably. And that's something I'll come back to when talking about our final results at the end. But second, and perhaps even more important, notice how focusing even on the most recent sample of data since 2000, the correlations between our measures of money growth and nominal GDP are as strong as, if not stronger, than they ever have been. That's important because many observers have associated the period of zero interest rates in the United States with the Keynesian liquidity trap. But if that analogy were exact, what we should expect to see are large movements in money with no uh, relationship to subsequent movements in nominal spending. Instead, exactly the opposite appears in the data. Here are similar statistics, but correlations with a measure of aggregate prices, the GDP deflator. And you can see the patterns are exactly the same. The only difference is that the lags needed to find the strongest correlations between money and prices are even longer than those for nominal GDP. And again, I'll come back to that point at the very end. So in order to explore in more depth the dynamic relationships between money growth on the one hand and nominal GDP and prices on the other, we adopt in this paper the framework uh, of the P-star model. Some of you re uh, may remember the P-star model was a single equation, empirical model of price level determination with explicit quantity theoretic foundations developed at the Federal Reserve Board in the late 1980s. The academic style paper was published 
published by Harmon, Porter, and Small in 1991. And a first footnote to that paper credits Alan Greenspan for coming up with the idea. The reason I mention this detail is just to highlight the fact that if you go back in time to the late 1980s or even the early 1990s, you could still find in those days papers in leading academic journals that did take a quantity theoretic approach to monetary policy analysis. And you could still find leading policymakers at the Fed and other central banks around the world with an expressed interest in developing quantity theoretic alternatives to monetary policy evaluation. So even though the quantity uh, theory has been set aside for a while, doesn't mean there's no point in bringing it back, especially in the aftermath of an episode where many of us feel that monetary policy may have gone off track in one way or another, having a quantity theoretic alternative is useful for no other reason than use as a cross check, like David Laidler mentioned earlier, just to make sure that monetary policy conducted in a more conventional way doesn't go off track again. And that's really the spirit in which Mike and I offer up this research to you and others today. Whoops. So the P-star model uh, is, as I said, it does have explicit quantity theoretic foundations. It's built directly on the uh, quantity equation. It rearranges the quantity equation, like at the top of this slide, with P isolated by itself on the left-hand side. That invites us to think about policy-induced movements in the money supply then feeding through, affecting prices and other nominal variables economy-wide. The P-star model then assumes that there's some long-run equilibrium level of velocity, V-star, towards which actual velocity tends to converge over time, and real GDP converges to potential over time, so that if one calculates P-star, that's what gives the model its name, the price target dictated by the current level of the money supply once V and Y converge to their long-run levels, what the theory expects expects you to see is a convergence of the actual price level towards P star over time. Now, the original P star model was developed as a model of price level determination, but we can and do in the paper extend the P star model or adapt it to handle the case of nominal income targeting as well. As a matter of fact, with nominal income targeting and advantages, you don't have to rely on any estimate of potential output. All you do is to calculate the nominal income target, X star, dictated by the current level of money and your current estimate of V star. And then as V converges to V star, you expect to see actual nominal GDP converging to X star. Now, in their original formulation of the P-star model, Hallman, Porter, and Small used simple sum M2 as their measure of money and assumed that V-star was a constant. Here, we do something slightly different. Instead, we allow for time variation in V-star, driven by low frequency movements in interest rates, payments and uh, changes in the payment system, and so on and so forth. And we estimate that time varying V-star using the trend component from a one-sided version of the Hodrick Prescott filter, one-sided so that the approach can be implemented in real time, using data that are actually available when policy decisions need to be made. Now, going back one last time to that theme, measurement matters. Here's a graph of simple sum M2 velocity, and it shows what, again, many of us remember. Before 1990, simple sum M2 velocity was pretty close to constant. Then, in the early 90s, it shifted upward, and that's what threw the original P-star model off track and led to its abandonment. But look at what happens when you calculate divisia M2 velocity instead. If you were looking at the appropriately constructed monetary aggregate from the start, you never would have gotten the idea that velocity is constant. Instead, you would have done from the start what we're doubling back and doing now, which is to come up with a way of estimating adaptively in real time a time varying value of V star. So here, going back to our preferred divisia MZM measure, the blue line is actual velocity. The red line comes from our one-sided HP trend. You can see that there are gaps, but the gaps are small and they get closed pretty quickly. That suggests to us that the approach shows promise. Here's the analogous figure for uh, the adjusted monetary base. 
And finally, here is one of the gap variables that we construct with our P star model. This is just an example, nominal GDP targeting with Divisia MZM, but the other gaps constructed with the adjusted monetary base or for the price level, they look quite similar. You can see those in the paper. So again, how do we construct the gap? We begin by constructing or calculating the nominal GDP target dictated by the current period's level of Divisia MZM and our current estimate of V star. And then we calculate the percentage point difference between the nominal GDP target and actual nominal GDP. And we interpret periods where the gap is negative, like in the early 1980s, as periods when monetary policy was contractionary, exerting a downward influence on the growth rate of nominal variables, and periods with a positive gap, like at the depths of the financial crisis, is a period when policy was expansionary, reflating the economy, so to speak. And to test the theory, we run regressions of the same form used by Hallman, Porter, and Small. Here, little p is the log price level. So delta squared p is not inflation, it's the change in the inflation rate. So the change in inflation rate in inflation is being regressed on four quarterly lags of itself, plus the lag value of the price gap, the null hypothesis, which the theory let, uh, tells us that we want to see rejected, is that C is equal to zero, we expect, in other words, according to the theory, to obtain adjustment coefficients C that are positive and statistically significant, implying that positive gaps put upward pressure on inflation, negative gaps downward pressure on inflation. Here's the analogous regression for nominal GDP. Again, changes in nominal GDP growth on four of their own lags plus the lag value of the nominal GDP gap. Here at last are our results. So this is for nominal income targeting with Divisia MZM. Notice first the adjustment coefficients positive throughout. Notice also that moving from an early subsample before 1980 to after, the size of the coefficient goes down, reflecting slower adjustment, the longer lags that we saw in the reduced forms earlier. Finally, notice how the p-values allow us to reject the null hypothesis that c is equal to zero at a very high level of statistical significance, except possibly for the most recent period. There, the rejection is simply at the 10% level. For that reason, I just wanted to show you some quick checks for robustness. Do the same test for the same recent period, but with Divisia M1 or M2 instead of MZM, you rejected an even higher level of significance. So this is a robust finding throughout. Same thing with the monetary base. Again, positive estimates of C, magnitudes decrease before versus after 1980, reflecting slower adjustment, statistically significant coefficients throughout. So we view these results as quite positive, suggesting that the Fed Reserve could achieve or could implement successfully a nominal GDP targeting strategy based around its ability to influence either the monetary base or a broader Divisia monetary aggregate. The results turn out to be a little bit different for price level targeting, though. Price level targeting for Divisia MZM. We're able to reject the null hypothesis that C is uh, equal to zero in favor of the alternative that C is positive for the full sample and for the early subsample before 1980, but not for the late subsample since 1980. And for the most recent period, the coefficient actually turns out to be negative. Results are a little bit better with the monetary base, but not much. At least the coefficients are positive throughout, but basically it's insignificantly different from zero for the more recent period. So just to wrap up and just to be clear, we do not interpret the negative results for price level targeting as implying that inflation is not every, always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. We believe that it is. Instead, we refer back to the lags and the reduced form correlations that I showed you earlier and conclude that these lags are too long and probably too variable as well to be fully captured or adequately captured by a simple time series model of the kind that would be needed to run a successful target 
targeting strategy. But again, the results for nominal GDP are much more encouraging. The links between money growth either is measured by the monetary base or a broader divisio aggregate in nominal GDP seem strong enough. They've remained strong even through the financial crisis and the Great Recession to make a nominal GDP targeting strategy built around a quantity variable a real possibility. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, so I'll start it off with just a few questions. And um, I'll, my first question is actually for you, Peter and, and David and Miles, if you have some thoughts on it, I'd love you, you to uh, um, uh, offer them as well. And I, the, the essence of both of your papers is that we can come up with a money targeting rule that then there restores output and nominal income onto some optimal path. And the big question in my mind is that what is the mechanism by which expanding the money supply, which the central bank still has a lot of control over, translates into aggregate spending. I mean, that's the part that's always missing for me, and that seems to be the essence of the liquidity trap. You can print and print and print, and print money, but you can't actually force people to spend. Walk me through that. How does actually just doing that, especially when you're stuck at the zero bound, actually generate spending? Whoops, that's an excellent question. I, I mean, I guess in response to your skepticism, I would, ref I would first refer back to the correlations that I showed on the slides. I mean, as an empirical matter, it does seem like, even over the most recent period, changes in money, either a broad divisia aggregate or the adjusted monetary base, have been followed by changes in nominal GDP. On a less formal level, I would note, for example, that if you take a look at broad money growth since uh, the financial crisis, although the Federal Reserve through QE has dramatically expanded the monetary base, the amount of broad money growth the Fed's policies have produced has not always been uh, excessive by any means. And at times, in fact, money growth has dropped. In 2010, when the Fed Reserve pulled back from QE1, broad money growth fell precipitously. And so the quantity theory would suggest that slow money growth during the recovery may be a big part of why we have sluggish real GDP growth and slow inflation since then. So my first response would be to say that even if we don't yet have a fully formed model like the new Keynesian model that links changes in money to changes in nominal spending, in the data those connections do seem to be there. David? Yeah, I would, two points. Uh, first, the whole idea of level targeting is that the central bank has committed to make up for past mistakes. So it's, it's a more serious commitment to correcting past um, uh, misses of the target. Um, but as part of my proposal, I, I think there is a credibility issue. If, if, if you're worried that why would people take the central bank seriously, that's my whole treasury backstop um, justification, that if the Fed did nominal GDP level targeting and it didn't bring about a recovery in nominal demand, the treasury steps in and it's the threat of doing it. I don't think it actually would have to do it, but the threat of the Treasury stepping in and backstopping the target, literally, I mean, systematically doing helicopter drops, and again, in a rule-based, automatic fashion that would make this very credible. You wouldn't have to worry about it, because you knew no matter what happened, both the Fed and the Treasury were committed to this target. So I, I think of um, these, these quantity rules as being helpful partly because they're they're, they're a way of telling people you're going to do big enough interest rate movements to get the effects. I mean, as, as far as the theoretical issue, it's, it's really remarkably easy to explain why, why interest rates will have the effects they have on the economy. You take every single borrower-lender relationship in the economy, and if the interest rate goes down in that borrower-lender relationship, you have several things going on. You have uh, you have a countervailing wealth effect. If the interest rate goes down, now, now the, the borrower is better off and the lender is worse off, but borrowers tend to have a higher propensity to consume than lenders, so that's stimulus. And then you have 
um, a substitution effect, which just means it looks cheaper to spend now relative to later. So that's some extra effect. That's true for every borrower lender relationship. Sometimes people say, oh, lower interest rates are going to make people save more. But they're forgetting that those savers have somebody on the other side of that transaction who's borrowing from them, who, who has a wealth effect going, going the opposite direction. So once you have that principle of countervailing wealth effects, it's really very clear that interest rates have the effects they they do, except in the very, very rare case where you have borrowers with a lower propensity to consume than, than lenders. But if I hear you correctly, Miles, you're essentially saying that the uh, money targeting frameworks that David and Peter are talking about can be useful as commitment devices. The ultimate lever is still the interest rate, which gets back to me, which I, takes me back to my original point. So long as the interest rate is still stuck at zero, I don't see the mechanism by which just telling people that you're going to print money gets them to spend. And this is a practical question because I'm a journalist, right? So part of my job is to report on what central banks do. And central banks, re uh, the public reads my article and they respond to it. Well, when back in the time of Volcker, when Volcker said, I am going to keep the interest rate in double digits until inflation rolls over, I can conceptually understand how that was affecting people, you know, because unemployment kept going up until inflation went down. In this world, I don't see that connection. Well, let me respond to that. Um, <clears throat> Again, if, if we had the nominal GDP level target, and let's say we implemented via Taylor rule, so we were using interest rates, and let's say for some reason we hit the zero lower bound. Again, I don't think we would with a level target, but let's say for the sake of argument we did. And so they're out of ammunition is your point. What do they do? Well, what would happen is the Treasury would step in. It would, it would sell the bond to the Fed. It would get the currency and start sending checks to households. That's the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it's that commitment, that credibility um, that would – in my mind, automatically get the, the, the public to start spending, velocity would go up. And so when you've got the backing of the Treasury and the Fed, it, it significantly raises the credibility. So there, there is a mechanism, and the expectation of that mechanism by itself should be corrective. But that's not really monetary policy. That's, that's fiscal policy, isn't it? It's, it'd it's be a radical. Like a it, 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 it's an NGD, an NGDP As I said when I proposed it, I might be thrown authority. out of the room for it. But yeah, it is... It is um, it is a little bit tapping into fiscal policy, but I, I would stress again, though, it's, it's a commitment more than anything. If you know the, the Treasury is there, you don't really have to tap into it. A, a new radical. version of the Treasury, the famous uh, Pulse and Bazooka. A, a little less radically, if you, um, if you are focusing on, on monetary aggregates the way Peter is, target, is talking about, that might uh, be a way to get people to expect that you would keep the interest rate longer at zero than, than they otherwise would. And so that, that could have an effect. You know, I think it's, it's better to have the interest rate go down a lot for a short period rather than long periods of, of zero interest rates are very bad for savers compared to short periods of negative rates. But, uh, but, but it's still better to, you know, if, if you do decide to keep the um, zero lower bound, which as a policy choice, then uh, the, talking about the monetary aggregate could be a way to get people to believe that you'd keep the rate at zero for a long time. But if, if I could tr try one last thought experiment that might help. Um, imagine if, uh, you know, you have $100 in your pocket right now, interest rates are zero right now, and I give you an extra $100, you now have $200. Now, maybe you're not going to go out and spend all of that money right away, and actually what would increase the chances of your not uh, spending the money right away would be if you thought the Fed would reverse the actions that increase the money supply in the first place, so there, would, uh, net, there wouldn't be an increase in the price level, then you know you you could just hold on to the money. It would be as good as having the money in the bank or buying government bonds or stocks or whatever. But if you knew in advance, as in David's framework, that the increase in the money supply was permanent, so that not only did the money in your pocket double, but the money in everybody's pocket doubled, and so sooner or later, prices are going to be twice as high than they are today, then you're going to feel more of an urgency to spend spend the extra $100 before the prices rise. So that would be a traditional quantity theoretic explanation of how alone an increase in M, irrespective of what's happening with interest rates, could affect nominal spending. I, well, if I could just, but I just want to respond to that, because the mechanism by which you get that $100 into my pocket is critical, right? Because that 
essentially is what David's recommending. As I said, as we agree, that's fiscal policy. That's not really a monetary rule. Well, I mean, when the central bank um, operates on the monetary base, they're out there buying assets and creating money, which ends up in the banking system, right? The banking system, in order for that to actually span broad money and credit aggregates, has to find somebody to borrow, right? But if, you know, risk aversion is so high that nobody wants to borrow, that is the essence of the liquidity trap, unless the fiscal authority overcomes that risk aversion well, by going out and doing the spending. I, 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 again, I... It's clear from David's analysis and other analysis, it, it, it's clear throughout monetary history that, I, I mean, we say that, mo you know, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, but it's just as clear that fiscal considerations play a role in what happens to the money supply in the long run. Hyperinflations are at the opposite extreme. They occur not because a central banker says, gee, maybe there's a Phillips curve and we can really exploit it by having, you know, 10,000 percent inflation per year. It's usually because there's a budget crisis and it's usually because there are you know, it's in the aftermath of a war where there are men with guns that want to be paid, and the only way to pay them is to print money and hand it over. But from a monetarist perspective, the key difference between fiscal and monetary policy would be that fiscal policy involves the total nominal value, the nominal value of total outstanding uh, government liabilities, including government bonds, as well as money, as well as Fed Reserve notes and reserves. So I would contend that even if it was pure monetary policy, so that instead of giving you $100, you, uh, the Fed Reserve bought a $100 government bond, so you're without the $100 government bond, but you now have $200 in your pocket. If somehow the, uh, the central bank convinced everyone that those $200, that the money supply had permanently doubled, everyone would expect the price level to double, and that expectation of faster inflation is what would bring about the change. Greg? Uh, one last thought. Um, I have in the paper the, the case of Israel during the Great Recession. It approached the zero lower bound never, and just barely missed it. And the reason is because it did have a permanent monetary base injection. Now, it did it through massive foreign exchange intervention. But I, I show in the paper the graphs. There's a clear one-time jump that in, in the, uh, the path of the monetary base. And, and Israel had one of the best performances during the Great Recession. Probably Australia is the only one that did better. And it effectively followed the prescription of some of the, the proponents, uh, Lars Finson's proposal, how do you permanently increase the monetary base? He says go out and intervene in the foreign exchange market. Bennett McCollum, similarly. So it does work. I mean, there are cases where it's been done. It does work. Interesting. Uh, Miles, a question for you. So um, you've uh, talked about how interest rates are really the superior instrument, and we should be using them more aggressively and creatively, actually. Um, once again, with the zero nominal bounty, you have some interesting ideas about how to overcome that, which uh, amount to negative interest rates and the withdrawal of cash. And you talked about um, Ken Rogoff's um, uh, uh, new book, and we actually had an excerpt in the Wall Street Journal of that uh, book a few uh, weeks ago. And uh, I watched the email and the tweets and the uh, comments on the website, and they were running about 99 to 1 against Ken, uh, mostly calling this like, you know, just a, a terrible, evil, egregious, you know, a variant of government theft of like invading our pockets, vacuuming out our money for all sorts of evil purposes, robbing us of the last bit of privacy. <laughs> that, So I suggest that whatever the economic arguments, which are substantial, are, is that you've got a big political problem there. And I would add that um, negative interest rates um, seem to be having extremely negative and perverse effects on bank equities. Every time in Japan or Europe the, wor the prospect of negative uh, interest rates comes up, their stocks tank. And that can't possibly be good for the monetary transmission um, mechanism. So my question to you is, um, what is the answer to these very practical problems of actually getting to the theoretical benefits that you've yeah. outlined? Well, this, this is exactly what my the talks I'm giving central banks on. And so that, that there's, there, there, there's three hours worth <laughs> that I'm convincing central banks to listen to. But um, basically, uh, the, you know, first of all, the, I think the politics are very interesting to talk about. There, there are um, some very basic things you want to do that, that aren't being done yet. One is you want to be very clear that people with uh, 
small checking and savings accounts uh, aren't going to see negative interest rates in those accounts. And that's really remarkably easy to do just with a, a tiered interest on reserve formula that's linked to the, you know, the, the banks voluntarily providing evidence of the amount of, uh, of, of these small accounts that they have. And so you assure people they won't face uh, negative interest rates in their checking and savings accounts, but they will see lower positive rates for auto, you know, getting an auto loan and, and mortgages and so on. So that, that helps. Um, this, this uh, effective subsidy for the zero interest rates on small accounts is also basically money you're throwing to banks. The other thing that helps the banks a lot is to lower the paper currency interest rate, which is something that no, no central bank has done yet. So, I, I mean, a lot of these are, are, are the zero lower bound in action. As it is now, what is the zero lower bound made of? The zero lower bound is not yet made of people storing large amounts of cash. I think we're a ways away from that. What the, zero lower what the lower bound is made of is concerns about bank profits, and you do get concerns about bank profits if the banks have to worry about uh, people putting their money in cash. So it's not, it's not sort of large, whole-scale storage of cash, but banks worrying about, uh, about that. And so it is important at some point to to lower the rate of return on cash. The other thing to say about the politics is, uh, I mean, look at the politics for central banks of what we actually did. I mean, the best politics for a central bank is to get the job done and get quick economic recovery. I mean, why is the Fed unpopular and their chance of end the Fed? Two things, one is the bail Fed's role in the bailouts, but that's not the only one. The fact that it took us so long to get recovery is a big part of it. If you'd had quicker recovery, then, you know, of course people would have complained about the negative interest rates along the way, but with quick recovery, that would have all blown over by now. Um, as far as the other practical problems, I mean, a lot of these really are strains from not lowering the paper currency interest rate, because if you lower all the, all the interest rates in tandem, including the paper currency interest rate, banks live on spreads. As long as the spreads are normal, the banks should be fine. Even in terms of what's actually happened, it's not the bank's profits haven't gone down yet. It's fears about what will happen to bank profits in the future. And so it's banks being afraid, oh, no, maybe, maybe they'll leave the paper currency interest rate at zero and we're going to have problems in the future. So I think a, a, a key remedy is to have the central banks express a willingness to have the paper, current, paper go off par. And then it's not so hard on bank profits. Um, love to get some questions now from the floor. Uh, if you have a question, I think we have um, a microphone. Uh, right over here, yeah. I was going to start out by saying state your name and affiliation, but I don't think John Taylor of Stanford needs to do that. <laughs> John Taylor of Stanford. Um, so my question is related to uh, Peter's presentation mainly, and also Greg's question. If you took uh, what I call a New Keynesian model, a good one, which would have a money demand equation in it, which times we threw many of those out in the past, but I have some good models like that. You could simulate uh, a, a money growth rule. In fact, we did. We used to do that constantly, and then we changed to interest rate rules. But in that context, you you, you can have good performance, assuming you have reasonable uh, stability of money demand or a V. So it's it's really not surprising in that context, but. And, and I think that answers Greg's question, too, because if you simulated an increase in money or an increase in money growth, you can trace through the long-term interest rate effects, the short-term interest rate effects, the exchange rate effects, and, any, and there's a whole wide range of financial influences. The transmission mechanism is not just the funds rate, it's whether it's stuck at zero or not. So it seems to me that's the way to think about this. You, and that brings me to a question is, what is the, what is the policy recommendation that you come from this? Is it fixed MZM? Is it feedback MZM or whatever? I think that's kind of a question I'd like to get the answer to. Right. Thanks, John. Um, well, there's a two-part answer to that question. If you wanted to take the approach seriously and, and offer it up as an alternative to what the Fed Reserve is doing now, what you would do, it would be a kind of flexible monetary targeting where you would figure out what your target path for nominal GDP was, 
And then given your current estimate of the long run, of long run velocity, you would then trace out the target path for, for the broad money supply or the adjusted monetary base. But you would also, along the way, because you're allowing for a time variation in velocity, you would be willing to adjust the target in response to changes in velocity. So in other words, you would be adjusting the growth rate of the base or adjusting the growth rate of a broader monetary aggregate in order to keep nominal GDP on target. Another way that the framework could be used, though, is, as David Laidler referred to earlier, in, in a, a manner that's similar to the way that the two-pillar approach was supposed to work at the ECB, where you use it as a cross-check. You let the FOMC do something like Bob Hetzel recommended, a more systematic forecast, macro forecast uh, strategy built around control of the federal funds rate, as always, but you ran this thing in the background, and if you saw money growth going off track in one direction or another, you would be, uh, you, would, you would pause and ask why. Can I just add parenthetically here, there's something about your presentation and your remark that I've been thinking about. You know, going back to Canada in the early 80s, um, the Bank of Canada was following a money targeting rule just like the Fed, and they also abandoned it. And Gerald Bowie, the governor at the time, famously said, we didn't abandon M1, M1 abandoned us, which was another way of saying the velocity became completely unstable. And if I, you know, carefully look at your slides, it does look like velocity fell a lot after 2008, yes. and it hasn't gone back yet. So we could be waiting a very long time for that long-run velocity relationship to re you know, reassert itself. And in the meantime, I'm not sure that we're actually getting to your target. Um, well, to answer that, I mean, we're, but our V star is tracking velocity downwards. So this isn't old fashioned monetary targeting where you would set M and then, and even though velocity is shifted up or, or down, you do nothing. Velocity falling would mean that you need to increase the growth rate of the money supply even more. So if, what you're getting at is kind of what are the practical implications of this approach now? I am sympathetic to the comparison between rates predicted by the Taylor rule and the current level of the federal funds rate very low and worried that that might mean that the Fed is falling behind the curve. But one of the things that makes me less worried than I think many people, others are, you included, John, is the observation that, you know, when you combine money growth like of about 6% per year, which is what we're seeing, combined with declining velocity. Um, it looks to me like monetary policy is either about right or maybe even a little bit too contractionary even now. So again, using it as a cross check, you know, you could imagine Janet Yellen with an approach like this saying like, look it, I know that according to the Taylor rule, interest rates should go up, but I'm worried for the following reasons. Inflation is below target. Money growth seems insufficient given the decline in velocity. We want to wait a little longer. The difference is that then you're constrained in the future if money growth does begin to accelerate and velocity turns around, and you say, well, now's the time to act. Uh, next question. Uh, Dennis Campbell, uh, independent investment advisor. Um, let me add to Greg's skepticism about the transmission mechanism by introducing the element of debt. Um, isn't it quite possible, even likely that in a world of high individual consumer and corporate debt, uh, there is no, there's an interest in, repay, in, in paying off debt, not consuming more, businesses don't particularly want to invest in such a world. Therefore, monetary policy becomes largely ineffective. Uh, David, why don't you handle that one? Well, I'll uh, refer you to Kevin Shitty's paper at the Brookings. <laughs> um, what, one of the advantages of nominal income targeting is it provides for better risk sharing. So such debt burdens um, do not create problems for the economy. That would be the first thing I would say. Um, and I have this in my paper as well, that uh, nominal income targeting shifts risk in a more equitable manner across both creditors and debtors. The other thing is, is it's not so much, I like to view it not so much as a creditor-debtor issue all the time as, as money demand. Um, you, want to, you want to decrease the uh, demand for money when there's been a shock it's, no matter what drives it, a, a debt shock, uh, some other external shock, when money demand goes up, you want some kind of offset to that. 
And, and you can do that by raising expectations of the future price level. Either of you want to uh, address the question of debt? Okay. Uh, next question. Hey, I'm Derek Timmy with the FDIC. So my question is, to the extent that printing money and, and mailing it to people is an option for conducting monetary policy, why wouldn't that be more frequently employed uh, as an alternative to doing it through the banking system? That seems kind of... Yeah, I do have a, a blog post, helicopter money is not the answer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, mostly, you know, w once you've eliminated the zero lower bound, I think uh, the, the attractions of helicopter money wouldn't be so great. I mean, I think helicopter money is a much, much more radical approach than uh, having a non-zero paper currency interest rate. Well, uh, I just want to clarify the question. Were you saying, wouldn't it be a great thing to use it more often, or are you saying, wouldn't it be worrisome if we started be abused. using it a lot? I think you're saying, would it be abused? Is that, is that the issue? No, I'm I, so I'm really saying I think it could, I don't see why that wouldn't be more effective than just lowering interest rates by buying bonds or In something. other words, why don't we just turn over stabilization policy to fiscal policy through one of these? Is well, that, let me that's be, be of, clear again. My proposal was, you know, it, it's a rules-based automatic. You can think of it as an increase in the automatic stabilizers, something that you don't go to Congress, it just automatically kicks in. And, you know, and, and the details need to be worked out more, but my idea is, is that the Treasury maybe once a year some automatic, you know, uh, mechanism where it, it meets, if it's below, if the uh, nominal GDP is below target, it, it kicks in. If it's above target, it kicks in uh, in an opposite way. But uh, again, my, my belief is that just having that mechanism available would mean that velocity would automatically adjust and you wouldn't have to actually tap into it. Uh, next question. Okay. Uh, Tracy Miller, Mercatus Center. My question is for David. Uh, it's your, your basic, your, your trend of the uh, uh, bank reserves. Um, so, so your trend shows bank reserves going down starting in 2016 from the current $4 trillion level down to like $1.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are, are most, is most of that going to be through <coughs> things like mortgage-backed securities that actually mature, or is, does it involve having to actually sell off treasury securities, which, which you could raise questions about whether that's going to happen. Okay. So just to be clear, that's the Fed's uh, projection, not mine. Right. But under their exit proposal, their exit right. strategy in the 2011, 2014, uh, it would largely come through just not reinvesting their principal payments. So the, 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 uh, the debt would mature. Right. And at some point, it would, it would shrink. In fact, between QE1 and QE2, this was a problem. The Fed's um, balance sheet did shrink, and it made them nervous, and so they started reinvesting. Um, so it actually, and Bernanke's talked about this, it actually could take place re relatively quickly. The Fed has been hesitant to do it because they're concerned about financial conditions and the disruption it might make. Um, but, you know, Janet Yellen at, at Jackson Hole, she reiterated her commitment to doing this in her speech. Um, so for now, the Fed seems um, committed to doing it, although there's been a lot of push. I mean, it was interesting that Ben Bernanke, um, he had a blog post after the conference, and he's pushing for now keeping the balance sheet permanently larger. As Fed chairman, he made several speeches emphasizing it's going to shrink, it's going to shrink, it's going to shrink. Um, so he's taken an interesting twist, and I don't know where this is all going to end up. But even if it is permanent, the interest on reserves is effectively going to create the same effect as if it had been reduced, and that is effectively sterilized. Uh, sure. Yeah, to repeat this for the audience. John and I would say that Simon Potter, in his speech at Jackson Hole, said we're pushing that barrier out to 2018. Well, well you're right that they were promising 2016 to start normalization. Uh, Simon Potter now says 2018, oh, and right. I tend to believe him because he's the guy who will do it. That's right. Well, it, you know, if you look at the uh, annual reports where I drew that graph from, um, it's been since 2010, and as I, I think I mentioned, every year it's been pushed out. <laughs> so the, the Fed's committed to it, and, and the market believes it, otherwise inflation would be you know, skyrocketing. So the, the Fed's committed to it, and uh, it may take a long time before we get there. Uh, we have one last question from the floor. Thanks. Uh, Rich Danker, I had a question on the same topic, I guess mainly for uh, Professor Beckworth. Uh, do you think there's a possibility that the temporary nature of the stimulus, the Fed's balance sheet, uh, 
is actually harming growth? In other words, is the fact that velocity is in a free fall and that um, uh, uh, people are perhaps waiting, delaying um, spending purchases until prices might fall when the Fed uh, chops the balance sheet, sheet back to normal, is that actually hurting real growth? Is there a possibility of that? Everyone, and the literature you cited seems to say that uh, the temporary aspect is at least ineffective, but I haven't heard anyone necessarily make the case that it, it might actually be uh, causing growth to, you know, uh, do worse than it otherwise would without, without such a large balance sheet. I do think that it, it's prevented a robust recovery, at least in nominal income growth. And maybe in 2009, 2010, 11, it would have also you know, supported real growth um, at a faster pace. But I, this is kind of QE paradox. By doing QE as a way to get around the zero lower bound, um, they're effectively preventing a recovery in nominal expenditures because it, the balance sheets are so big, they cannot credibly commit to making those permanent. I um, you know, if, if I, I didn't mention this, but you know, if, in, in terms of how much would they need to make permanent? So in 2009, at, at the bottom of the um, the business cycle would have been based on where the, the, uh, the using currency as kind of a, a baseline for where kind of the pr truly permanent level of the, the base is. They needed would have, they would have injected 67.5 billion. Um, so small change compared to what actually has been done. Um, e even as recent as the end of 2015, just the back of the envelope, um, they would have had to have in increased the monetary base 150 billion above that baseline trend. Very small. You don't need a lot of, of permanent increase in the monetary base to, to have the, the effect of raising nominal demand to its, its pre-crisis trend path. Uh, I'm going to finish off with one quick question of my own because I'm a journalist. And so I'd like to ask each of the panelists, should the Fed raise interest rates this year, given the way that you look at the world and your models? I'll start with you, Peter. Um, my own, the short end, no. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, but you, you actually laid out the reasons why money growth is slowing down. It seems that policy is too restrictive already, right? I, I mean, I think I'd... I'd, I'd rather say what, what I said about them raising their rates the first time, which was that they, they should not raise rates until they say they would quickly lower them again if need be. So I, I think that, that the whole next rate raise becomes much less portentous if rather than saying, oh, we've got this policy where there's this huge penalty on changing directions. No, if we find out we were wrong, we'll, we'll go back the other direction. And so I would like to take the whole portent out of the, this big deal about whether they raise the rates away by saying they, they ought to be uh, data dependent in both directions. Okay, assume that we've removed that portent, okay, and they're, and they're saying this is <laughs> for as long as the data is good. Should they do it? Should they raise rates? I, 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 they know a lot more than I do okay. about exactly uh, where the rates should be. I'll say no. I mean, they don't want to get ahead of the recovery. As, as Scott Sumner said earlier, you want to have robust nominal growth before you attempt to raise rates. Otherwise, you will just repeat what happened in Europe in 2011. All right. That's a pretty, I wouldn't have thought of coming in, but that was a pretty dovish panel I just moderated. Thanks very much. This is really great. <laughs>
Uh, I wanted to, to just play at devil's advocate by taking the, the monetary rule that probably has been most readily dismissed today and saying a word or two about that. That's uh, Milton Friedman's good old K percent rule. It was uh, said earlier that uh, we didn't abandon, that the Fed claimed it didn't abandon money growth or money rules, M1, but that M1 abandoned it. Well, I don't think that's actually true. And uh, Leland, Leland Yeager, who I wish could be here, has written about this. Uh, what if the Fed had, in fact, uh, implemented a, a straight uh, Friedman money growth rule when he first started advocating such a thing and when the demand function for money was or appeared to be stable, even measuring money the old-fashioned way, well, we might not have had the rise in inflation of the mid to late 70s or a lot less of it, and then perhaps we wouldn't have had the appearance of money market mutual funds the disintermediation of banks as a result of the comp their competition with those mutual funds, with Regulation Q. All of those things are big factors in the destabilization of money demand or velocity or whatever you want to call it. And of course, once that happened, money growth rules were no longer something anybody would argue seriously for, including Milton Friedman, who was not very... Uh, uh, who was very quick to uh, abandon what he had formally recommended and to start recommending uh, other alternatives. So there's a kind of uh, a sort of backwards Lucas critique that I'm appealing to here, right? Yes, sometimes if you try to exploit what you think is a stable relationship, you destabilize it, and then it ends up being a very bad thing to do. We learned that with the Phillips curve. We learned it once. I hope we learn it again. Uh, but sometimes it's just the opposite. If you don't act on a relationship that's there, then the relationship goes away and you can't act on it anymore. So I just wanted to add those two cents to the discussion. I don't know what difference it makes, but I think it does suggest that there's a real challenge in trying to assess rules where we really have to rely in mostly on hypotheticals and what-ifs that are, after all, rather difficult uh, uh, exercises to undertake. So thank you all again.